Good afternoon. I'm Jeannie Villanueva. I'm the president of the Women's Association. Welcome to the first 2013 Women's History Month event. The Women's Association continues to be a resource for improving the quality of women's work life since the first meeting in 1971. We celebrate successes and achievements, provide sources of information and collaborative solutions, as well as community outreach, such as Expanding Your Horizons, which will be held at Las Positas College tomorrow and at the University of the Pacific on October 5th. Please join us when we award educational scholarships on March 19th. I'd like to thank our co-chairs for Women's History Month for organizing exciting month, um, exciting month of events. Nadine Horner is our Vice President, Linda Lucchetti is Co-Chair of Communications and a past president. Please welcome Nadine Horner. Thank you, Jeannie. As you indicated, Linda, Linda Lucchetti and I are co-chairs of Women's History Month. And today we're kicking off our celebration for the entire month. Please make sure you look at Lab Book and Newsline for updates on what we have planned throughout the month. I'd also like to thank those who have contributed and will contribute to our campaign. Linda and I certainly could not do what we do without the help and support and dedication of others. So today's presentation is a first in a partnership between the Women's Association and DDLS. We are thrilled to partner with DDLS, and we are so honored to have Ellen Tauscher as our presenter, so thank you. Another first is that we have Denise Anderson from Toastmasters here to present the theme for Women's History Month. Denise? Thanks, everyone. I'm really honored to be invited here today to speak uh, for the Women's History Month 2013. And I'm also representing MicroCentury Toastmasters here at the lab. So you all need to come out to the MicroCentury Toastmasters. The theme today is women inspiring innovation through imagination and celebrating women in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So I'm a physician assistant here at the, at the lab, and I'm really privileged to take care of the people here at the lab. It's a great community that makes up this world-renowned institution. But the theme of this year's History Month has made me think about my own pro professional career path. My parents were not in medicine. My dad was a lawyer. My mom was a CFO. So they didn't have the background to help me understand medicine and to really inspire me other than expecting me to do well. So I had to look outside my nuclear family. And there, medicine, science, and technology has many notable women, especially at this time. But one woman in particular that really inspired me is Kathleen Blackwell. She was amazing. She was the first woman physician to ever be in the United States. And she graduated in 1849. Uh, the idea to pursue medicine for Dr. Blackwell was put in her head by her friend, a woman who was dying of a really painful t disease that was thought today to have been uterine cancer. Her friend expressed to her how much more comfortable she would have felt with a woman physician, a, a caring woman, especially given the type of cancer she had. I would imagine dealing with the males was very difficult for her. So at that point, Kat, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Blackwell, I'm sorry, did I say Kathleen? Elizabeth Blackwell, don't confuse. <laughs> she um, decided to per pursue medicine and she embarked on that journey. As you can guess, she was not very welcome in the medical schools that she applied to. Her attempts were futile at first, but she didn't give up. Most schools rejected her and told her that perhaps she should go to Paris to study medicine. Or another option they gave her was to disguise herself as a man to study medicine. But one of the most 
important reason she was given that they wouldn't take her into medical school is that she was a woman and therefore intellectually inferior. Well, luckily we've come a long way since 1894 and women are making huge impacts in today's world of science and technology. I know I certainly appreciate the importance of women in science as well as communication and leadership. So Toastmasters has helped me tremendously in my appreciation for clear communication and as a healthcare professional, clear communication is essential. In closing, I would like to share a quote from a remarkable, remarkable woman who is known mostly her, for her political career. But most people don't know that she graduated with a degree in chemistry and worked as a research chemist. The quote was, if you want something said, ask a man. If you want something done, ask a woman. <laughs> Margaret Thatcher. Back to Nadine. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Denise. We hope that this partnership between the Women's Association and Toastmasters, and maybe your group um, would work with Toastmasters, will continue. Please remember Toastmasters meets here at the laboratory every Tuesday. Now, I would like to introduce Donna, and she's going to tell us about the building we're in, and then she's going to go ahead and have Parney introduce our guest of honor. So thank you. Thank you, Nadine, and good afternoon. Welcome, everybody, to the Nerve Center of Scientific Computing here at the laboratory. Um, I'm pleased to say that Ellen was here for our groundbreaking, and then she was here for our ribbon cutting. Uh, and then she just had a, a fantastic tour by Terry Quinn and got to see the computers up close and personal. So this, um, and, and that business about the Nerve Center, that's not my quote. I think that's Bruce Goodwin's quote. Uh, but I'm pleased to be able to say that because we really feel it's true even though we have many other computing facilities here at the laboratory. I mean, this facility embodies many of the values and characteristics that we think of that make a great laboratory, not the least of which is that we accept, honor, welcome ideas that come from everywhere. You know, it doesn't matter about the origin. It's, it's is it a good idea? Uh, of course, not that long ago, computing was thought of as a man's world and I'm glad it's still a man's world and a woman's world. So to, to me, to Women's History Month is, is celebrating and recognizing the accomplishments of women, but not to take away from the accomplishments of men. And we need that balance always. Um, this, is, this laboratory and computation at this laboratory is a great example of women's leadership in um, the management of computation as well as in uh, actually performing the work. And so we're excited to see that. That's happened uh, in many other domains across this laboratory. So I, I think, again, this, this laboratory is the diversity of background, educational experiences, and culture that are brought together on problems, national challenges, uh, important problems that we have the privilege and responsibility to address. And I get to witness the examples of uh, inspiration and imagination coming to fruition every day by many, many brilliant people around here. That isn't to say there isn't room to do better, but today we're celebrating those accomplishments and looking at the considerable progress we've made. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to our director, Parney Albright, who will introduce our guest speaker. So thanks very much. Um, so we continue to recognize March as women's uh, National Women's History Month. We have a long history of, of doing that. Um, and certainly the uh, Lawrence Livermore Laboratory Women's Association has, uh, has led in that observance by organizing uh, activities such as this one. So I really appreciate Janie, thank you for your, you and your organization for doing that. And of course the theme this year that, uh, that about women inspiring innovation through imagination is certainly, certainly an appropriate one for this laboratory. So our speaker, Ellen Tauscher, is a longtime friend of the laboratories. She served as, um, she's been a champion for the mission and, uh, and the research capabilities and the unique value this laboratory has for, for the nation. She was uh, in Congress for 13 years, 
getting uh, um, only pulled out because she was asked to, by the administration to do some very, very important work as uh, Under Secretary of State. And um, represent, she, but she represented the uh, 10th Congressional District here and, uh, and represented both this laboratory and Sandia. So I first met Ellen, um, I guess, in 2002 when the Homeland Security Act was being, being drafted, her and her staff. And, you know, that was just one example of many that I could cite uh, that I've seen since of, you know, her capabilities and her energy and drive, you know, impacting the national security of this nation, you know, as recently as negotiating the New START Treaty or certainly helping to negotiate the New START Treaty with the Russians. And, you know, I, I've often thought that that would I, would, I would say those things independently of the fact that Ellen is a woman, although now that I've heard Denise's talk, maybe maybe the fact that she actually is, is one of the few people in Washington who knows how to get things done <laughs> is, <coughs> is uh, maybe I was wrong about that. Um, you know, Ellen has certainly contributed a lot to the Women's Association. Um, she's been present here for panels at, at, at a variety of times, at seminars, on issues. Um, and she today serves on the Board of Governors for both um, Lawrence Livermore National uh, Laboratory and for Los Alamos. So I really, really want to thank Ellen for, for being here today as we kick off Women's History Month and, uh, and turn it over to Ellen Tauscher. Thanks, Barney. Thanks. Thank you so much. You. Hi, everyone. It's so good to be home. Uh, I, um, I live most of the time in Washington these days for lots of reasons. Uh, including the fact that when I left the Congress in 2009, you know, no d good deed ever goes unpunished. So here I am representing the smartest people in the world from the most beautiful place in the world in a district where I was getting 67, 68% of the vote with only about a 35% Democratic registration. And very happy, leader of the moderates, in the House. Can't find them anymore. <laughs> they got taken out in 2010. And uh, chairman of the Strategic Forces Subcommittee of the House Armed Services Committee. And I was actually the first person from this district to represent <laughs> the biggest employer in the district, these two labs, on the committee of record. And President Obama wins, and I get a phone call from my girlfriend, Hillary Clinton. I think we're talking about a birthday party that we're going to be doing for a friend of ours in a few weeks. And as only she can do, one moment she's chatting away, it's a Sunday afternoon, it's you know late February, she's just been sworn in as Secretary of State, and all of a sudden her voice changes and she says, Ellen, and I thought, what's that? And I said, yes, and she said, I need you to come to see me tomorrow. And I said, okay, I don't have votes tomorrow. It's Monday. I said, what do I have to come over and see you about? And she said, well, the president's calling you. In five minutes, you're going to be sec under Secretary of State. <laughs> really? <laughs> and you know, after she told me about the responsibilities, um, I vaguely knew what it was, because one of my pre predecessors was named John Bolton. And so I had watched what he had done. And I thought, you know, this is really important. The START Treaty is going to expire in December. We're, we're really without a, a treaty. And, um, you know, perhaps, perhaps I should take my own advice. My advice always had been, leave on your own volition and leave at the top. And so I thought about it. My daughter was going to be graduating from high school and going to college. And uh, we had just found out she'd been accepted at Bucknell. And so I thought, maybe I should do this. So of course I went to the State Department, and of course, you, you know, the, Hillary Clinton is a force of nature. If I had actually entertained for 30 seconds that I was going to say no, uh, I should have known better. So then I, uh, I, the president nominated me, and I got sworn in in June, and uh, became undersecretary. One of the biggest things was that I, I, I sold my house in Alamo because I, after I looked at my job description, I realized that I would not only not be in the United States, 
but I wouldn't be anywhere near California because we don't have arms control problems with California. <laughs> and the truth was, um, the three and a half years that I was undersecretary, I was only in Washington if I was in the United States. I never got to come to California for three and a half years because I spent most of my time either going to Moscow or Geneva or Pakistan or some other place. Uh, trying to work out many of our nonproliferation issues, getting the treaty done, getting the treaty ratified, going to New York uh, for the nonproliferation conference and doing things to stare down the Iranians. So it's really wonderful to get to come home. Uh, I, I actually retired from the government. Uh, some of you may know that I had a tough bout with a tough cancer uh, that I got to beat. And uh, so I left the government finally in September. I actually retired uh, about a year ago. But um, the president wanted me to stay on because our relationship with the Russians uh, was getting a little chilly. They were having a presidential election. We were about to have a presidential election. So I actually retired on February 5th. And the next day, I walked back into the State Department and got sworn as, in as special envoy for strategic stability and missile defense. And then I finally left that in September. So I'm actually retired. Uh, I'm out of government. I'm in the real world. Uh, the nice thing is that I got invited pretty soon after that, Parney, to become a member of the Board of Governors of both Livermore uh, National Security Corporation and Los Alamos. And so I sit on that board. Um, I don't think I, I might be the only woman, but I think I might be. Well, it's not the first time. <laughs> when I was a, growing up in New Jersey, my dad was a grocer. He ran big grocery stores for a and T Company. My father had been in the Navy. And uh, he, he's now 86. We call my father the luckiest guy in the world, because when my father walks out of the building, the building will fall over. My father graduated from high school in June of 1945 and went to the Navy, and the war ended. He was in the Navy for two and a half years. And they said, you know, you're a great radar man, but now I think you can go home. He got, went home, got married, married my mother. Korean War started. He went to Norfolk. Everybody else went to the Pacific. He was in Norfolk. I know he came back to New Jersey a few times because I was born 11 months later. <laughs> and he got out of the Navy and went back into the grocery business. My mom, um, mother of four, uh, worked in New York as a secretary. I grew up watching the World Trade Centers being built. I grew up in Harrison, New Jersey, which is in Hudson County, where the dead vote Democratic. I went to Holy Cross High Grammar School and Harrison High School and Seton Hall University. And I was the first in my family, like many of you, to go to college. I didn't want to be a teacher, but I really didn't want to be a nurse. And those pretty much were my options. I could be a teacher, or I could be a nurse. I couldn't be a nurse. So I became a teacher. Well, let's just say I graduated with a teaching degree. But in 1974, when I graduated from college, there were no teaching jobs in New Jersey. It was what we called the baby bust. They were closing schools. And of course, I had student loans and a whole bunch of other things that I had to do. So all I had to do was really look up. I looked up. There was the World Trade Center. I had lots of friends from high school and some from college that worked on Wall Street. So I went to, a, went to Wall Street, went to an employment agency, and got offered a management training job at a firm called Beach. Beach was the number two retail firm. Merrill Lynch was the number one. Beach was number two. They were buying all these little firms around the country. Most of the firms have the name of some dad and son, not daughter. And so I lived at home. I, my ambition was to get an apartment in New York. But I had student loans, and I was going to pay them back a little bit and then move into New York. I was 22 years old. And I used to take the PATH train. For those of you that know anything about New Jersey, PATH train from Newark. So I used to take the PATH train. And there was a gentleman on the train that I would see every couple of days that actually came to my building. 
where Bache was at 100 Gold Street. And I would see him, but I walked really fast because at Holy Cross School, we didn't have a cafeteria, so I had to go back and forth for lunch. We only had an hour, but we lived the furthest out of our town. So my sisters and I really learned how to walk fast. So when, when I left the PATH train at the World Trade Center, I would zoom off. And after about a month and a half of working in the management training program at Beige, my boss said to me, my boss wants to see you. He thinks that you're the fast walking woman. <laughs> I said, oh. So I go you know, up, up two floors in the elevator. And the management training program was really cool because you got to go see the whole firm, you know, got to understand exactly what happened. You were a problem solver. You got to see if Mrs. Jones called up and said, I have 1,000 shares of IBM in my account. They were there last month. They're not there now. Well, two things could be true. One is that Mrs. Jones is crazy, or that she actually did, and something happened to those shares, and you've got to go find them. And so we learned exactly how the firm worked. So I really liked it, because it was like problem solving. So I go upstairs to see this man, Mr. Sarkeesian, and he says to me, we have a job opening, but it's got to be someone that moves fast. <laughs> He said, and I've been watching your work now. He said, you really like what you do, and you're friendly. I said, well, great. What is it? He said, it's to work for the chairman of the company, Mr. Bage. And I thought, that can't be right. <laughs> I'd seen Mr. Bage. Mr. Bage was about 5'3", and had this big car that dropped him off in front of the building. And he kind of came in, went upstairs, then I assume he came out sometime during the day, because that was the only time anybody ever saw him. And he was, you know, a very powerful man. Name on the door. And so I said, well, do I have to interview with him? And they said, yes. And I said, well, what does he want me to do? And we, he's going to tell you. So I go up, and I meet Mr. Bage, and he's this lovely man. He's kind of got a German accent. His family emigrated. Uh, about 50 years before that, and he is, you know, a real Wall Street wizard. And so I get to speak time, you know, spend time with him, and he tells me that he wants to teach me how the firm works. He wants more women to be able to promote, and he knows I don't know have, have any family background, that I really shouldn't be there. And he meant it. But the world was changing. This was 1974. There weren't enough people with the name Beach to take over. And they were buying firms all over the country. He said, we bought a place in Boca Raton last week, and we're going to buy a place in Bakersfield next week. He said, do you know where they are? I said, Florida and California. He said, exactly. He said, we're a national firm. I said, OK. So I did. I went to work for him. He taught me a lot of what he knew. I worked for, there for three and a half years. Eventually, he got, uh, he said I could learn to trade municipal bonds. And the same day that I went up to the municipal bond desk where there were all these testosterone-based life forms, <laughs> no estrogen-based life forms, New York City declared bankruptcy. They took all the bonds of New York City, and they rolled them up into something called the Municipal Assistance Court. Always remember, change the name to protect the innocent. They put a big coupon on it, 9%, which was unheard of. And of course, they were tax-free. And they kind of, you know, changed the name to protect the innocent, covered them up, got rid of the bad debt, put the serviceable debt out there, put a big premium on it, and started competing with everybody else. And everybody wanted to own these bonds. And I got to trade them, because the testosterone-based life forms thought that they were not important. I was like a monkey with a machine gun. <laughs> I made a million dollars a week for the firm. And all the people trading them were people that I went out drinking with every night. <laughs> guys from St. John's, guys from Fordham, because they were guys on the desk. They were young. 
But once again, their testosterone-based life forms had gotten it all wrong. And these were actually the thing to do. And so we made a lot of money for the firm. And eventually, uh, we hoped to make money for ourselves. I was working there about six months when somebody at lunch on a Friday said to me, why don't you come work at, at my firm? We're going to pay you a lot more money. I thought, well, you know, I could use some money. There's a guy on my desk that doesn't even answer his phone. As far as I can tell, he goes to the men's room with the Wall Street Journal around 10.30. I don't see him again until 3 o'clock. <laughs> God only knows what's going on. But he made, you know, 10 times what I made. But I know that he wasn't making what I was making for the firm, so, you know, I kind of got my cell all torqued up and said, okay, what will you offer me? And he told me. I said, really? <laughs> well, then that's not a decision. And I went back and told my boss that I was going to have to leave. I'd been there three and a half years. It was time to go. I needed to see if I could make it outside of the shadow of Mr. Beige. Life is serendipitous. That same day, one of the floor partners on the New York Stock Exchange at Beige resigned at breakfast. So now this is three hours later. And he is going to go work for a guy named Ivan Boski. <laughs> that Ivan Boski, who went to jail right here in Santa Rita. And I'd never heard of Ivan Boski before. He subsequently became famous and went to jail. But <laughs> right here. <laughs> so I, um, I hear, you know, I hear about this, but I'm leaving. But my boss comes to me at about 10 to 3, and there was a board meeting with the partners in the boardroom right off the trading floor at 3 o'clock. And he said to me, Mr. Beach is really mad. He's mad that so-and-so is leaving and going to work for Ivan Boski, and he's mad that you're leaving because he thinks that you're supposed to stay because he's taught you all this stuff. And, <clears throat> and I said, well, I'm not being ungrateful. But that guy that just walks away with the Wall Street Journal at 10.30 makes five times what I make. And I, I deserve to make more money. I'm making a lot of money for the firm. Well, we'll give you more money. And I said, no, no, it's really, I've got to see if I can do this on my own. I feel like I'm, I've really benefited from Mr. Bates' largesse. I feel like it's been wonderful, but I think I need to go. So he says, well, you're going to have to tell him yourself because you're going in there at 3 o'clock. I thought, OK, fine, I can do that. So I sail in there at 3 o'clock. Mr. Beach is down at the end. And he's not happy. And he's saying, who is Ivan Boski? <laughs> and uh, we all had a big laugh about that later. And you know, why is this guy leaving? And then he looks at me and he says, and you? You know, I want you to stay. And you know, we, we're going we're gonna to make some changes. And I said, with all due respect, I need to go. I need to do something different. I need to prove that I can be out of your shadow. I need to know that I can do this. And he said to me, OK, you're going to the New York Stock Exchange. We're going to give you one of our seats. And I looked at him and I said, Mr. Bache, there are no women on the New York Stock Exchange. There's one woman who works for a smaller firm, and they hate her, and she eats lunch by herself. <laughs> he said, nobody eats lunch on the New York Stock Exchange. <laughs> I said, I don't really, I said, do you know that in order for me to go to the New York Stock Exchange, that I have to be an officer of the firm? You're a vice president. I said, do you know that I have to be paid just like the guys that are on the New York Stock Exchange? He goes, I'm going to pay you more than the guy that left this morning. So do you know that <laughs> they're, they're not socialized? They're not ready for this. And he said, you'll make them ready. And I said, with all due respect, <laughs> You've been leaving your women home for 50 years. I happen to know that you've got a smart daughter and a smart granddaughter that's just older than I am. They don't come to work with you. I said, most of you have left your women home. Wall Street has left women home for 200 years. Why today? 
And he says to me, I belong to a country club up in Westchester. My wife likes to have dinner parties on Saturday night. Sometimes we have food that just doesn't agree with me. Sometimes I have a little bit too much to drink. On Sunday, I like to go to the steam room. Interesting thing about a steam room, you don't always know who's in there. Sunday, I was in the steam room. Turns out two of my competitors came in, wrapped up in towels. I was wrapped up in a towel. I can only think of Yoda. <laughs> I was wrapped up in a towel quietly by myself in the corner. He said, unfortunately, it was the guy from Merrill Lynch. They're putting a woman on the New York Stock Exchange in six weeks. You're going Monday. <laughs> there are many lessons here, including about steam rooms. But the lesson is to be able to take advantage of something that happens to you serendipitously. The other lesson is to know when to say yes, which I did. And the other lesson is the lesson of Mr. Bage, which is to take advantage immediately of new facts and to make a very decisive decision that is almost out of character. I was questioning him because it was completely out of character for him to do something so innovative as to put me on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. If this had been something that he had just all of a sudden decided to do when he woke up in the morning, thought, well, it's time. It is time to have women because it is time to make sure that the other part of the population, the other 50%, who I want as customers, are actually also giving advice and are actually trading for them, too. It's time that we opened our business up because we don't have enough people with my last name. And we need people of all kinds of backgrounds because this might be a family business, but it is also a business that is dependent on American in innovation and we need to be able to use everybody. If I had thought that that's what he had done that day, I wouldn't have pressed him. But I knew it wasn't, and that's why I pressed him. And the best part was he gave me an even better reason. It was in his self-interest, <laughs> the ultimate interest, for me to go to the New York Stock Exchange on Monday. He was going to laugh up his towel every time he went into a steam room for the rest of his life. So he sends me to the New York Stock Exchange on Monday. They announce I'm going to become a member, and there are people that aren't happy. There are men there in their 70s and 80s and 90s whose families had been under the buttonwood tree, who had founded the original stock exchange called The Curb, and then created the New York Stock Exchange, which had become the most prestigious exchange in the world. And they left their women home for generations. We still were doing it. They liked the club. There was actually a luncheon club on the sixth floor that was only for members of the New York Stock Exchange. It had a room, and above the door it said, men's bar. And in order for me to go to breakfast in the morning to meet with my partners, I had to ha they had to change all the rules. So that Monday, as I was standing there trying to figure out how not to faint, there were about 20 men on the seventh floor boardroom changing all of their rules and not happy. And so what, what, was, my, what was my real job? Why did, years later, what did Mr. Bates tell me? Mr. Bates told me that the reason that he sent me was because I could walk and talk fast, because I was from Harrison, New Jersey, not Harrison, New York because I didn't have a dad on the New York Stock Exchange, because I read the sports pages and could talk about other things, and because I looked like their daughters and granddaughters, that they could relate to me, and that I wasn't going to be so interested in getting into the men's bar that I would make them take the sign down. I was a member of the New York Stock Exchange for three and a half years. The sign never came down. I never went in there. 
the little old guys that wanted to go up there and have their gin and tonic at 4 o'clock when the market closed still got to go in there and got to go in there by themselves. About 80 other people were outside in what was previously called the library having a drink with me. I chose not to go in that room to give them a place that was still theirs. Not because I thought that it was theirs to have, but because I thought that they deserved it. Change does not always happen when people expect it to or in the way they want it to. Change doesn't always happen in a way that people need it to or a way that people can embrace. You know, when I did my research on Women's History Month, it's interesting to find out that it all started at Sonoma State, that actually the headquarters for the Women's History Project is in Santa Rosa, California. So much of what is good and wonderful in the world happens out of California. It happens out of California because people have come here from literally all over the world to be in a place that is a crucible of brilliant, hardworking people who know that they have a chance here and that they're going to be able to compete. And competition is what this place is all about. When I would tell people, I need your vote on something, you know, when you become the expert on anything in Congress, it's usually not because you're the smartest person. It's because you have a reason to pay attention to that interest. And other people don't. And I would get 218 votes regularly for things that benefited the labs, not because people wanted to vote for me because I had some reason to, to ask them to do it, other than the fact that they knew that it was important to me and that I was willing to listen to them and give them my vote when I needed to. But in the end, they also knew that I worked for the smartest people in the world. The fact that you had elected me seven times is a great coincidence. <laughs> and one I tremendously appreciated. But it was absolutely true. I could prove it. I could talk about how many physicists and advanced PhDs and everything that was important we have here. How these valleys in Alameda County were blessed by people coming from all over the world to work at our labs. How some of them had stayed, decided to raise their families for generation after generation. And that more people kept coming. And that we always have the best. And that what we have done here has accrued the best science and the best national security that the country could ever dream about. And that most of you never have been thanked. You don't expect it. You're patriotic. You're hardworking. And you love your country. And you forego tremendous benefits in the commercial world where you could be paid a tremendous amount of money to be here because of the work and the mission, because of the culture and the environment, because of the people, and because you know what you mean to your country, even if your country doesn't always know what you mean to it. Women's History Month is a confection. It's not even 40 years old. It celebrates thematically every year an area that needs to be paid attention to. In recent years, it's been education and other things that women's vote, other things that are about getting women more power and more ability to move forward. Women in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and manufacturing is a huge opportunity. We all know the stories. We all know that somewhere around sixth grade, girls that have a proclivity and a talent for math and science start to ebb away. The idea that competing with boys that are verbally and physically more aggressive in class, the idea that society and the media don't exactly have 
women scientists out there in sexy, gorgeous roles, that there aren't a lot of people that you can look at and emulate, is all true. Those guys on the Big Bang Theory, <laughs> if that's what's going to be next to you in class, I mean, really. <laughs> Would you want to do that? So what, what do we do? How, how do we solve? This is a problem that I've been talking to my friends in the Women's Association, and thank you, Jean, and thank you, everyone, for having me here today. Uh, we've been talking about this since 1996, when I first came here, when I was running against Bill Baker. We, you know, I've talked about you know, having a campaign where we have women scientists. What is the most frightening thing that average Americans see someone wearing to work? that makes them feel repelled. A white lab coat. Think about it. A white lab coat means that you're a scientist, that you're smart. There's an anti-bias in this country about smart people. They make you a little off, feel a little off put, you know, a little nervous. I think we should have both our men and women scientists here at the labs, in white lab coats and on soccer fields, and in churches and in synagogues, and volunteering, and at the Safeway, and showing people that these are your neighbors. These are normal people. They're not average, but they are certainly, <laughs> can appear average. They can look average. But there's got to be something that we can do that helps solve this problem. My daughter, Catherine, who is the love of my life, who is now a senior at Bucknell, went to school in Washington, DC. When I won in 1996, she was in kindergarten in Walnut Creek. And so in January, I bought a house in December, moved her to Washington, and she went to the National Cathedral School. And she went all the way through. She, Beauvoir is their elementary school, and then she went to the National Cathedral School. And so here we are, and this is for Marco Rubio. The water needs to be right near you. <laughs> Poor thing. I mean, really. I mean, really. Poor thing. Uh, so she goes to the National Cathedral School, and um, you know, never worry about Catherine. She's just a nice kid. And so she goes first grade, second grade, third grade. They pick, they they kind of pick you. You know, they want you to go then to the National Cathedral School. So Beauvoir is co-ed, boys and girls, and then third grade, the boys go to St. Albans, which is on one side of the cathedral, and the girls go to the National Cathedral School, which is on the other side of the cathedral. And there is a myth that they actually have classes together. And they do, but really not. So it's really single sex education. And so Catherine's father and I were getting divorced. I, you know, I wanted some stability for her. She could have looked at other schools. There's Sidwell, Murray, there's a bunch of other schools. And so she's driving with me in the car. She's playing soccer. She's in the back seat. I'm in the front seat, looking in the rear view mirror at her. And I said, you know, honey, we could go look at other schools. We could look at Sidwell or Murray. I know some of your friends are looking at other schools. Do you want to go look at other schools for next year? No, Mommy, I want to go with my friends to NCS. I said, well, you know, you know, your mother has a little bit of an anti-bias against single-sex schools. It's just the way I am. I just think that real life is about boys and girls. I think being segregated, you know, you might have this sense that you're not getting intimidated by some more verbally aggressive boy in class or distracted, you know, at a certain age. But I, I tend to think that, you know, you have to kind of get a grip. That's what the world's about. So I don't really like single sex schools. And she's looking at me. Well, I mean, I'd, I'd like to go to NCS with my friends. So she goes. Fifth grade, we're in the car again, basketball this time. And she says to me, Mommy, I think I'd like to, because at six, there's another gateway. You can kind of change schools again. Mommy, I think I'd like to look at Sidwell Friends. 
So I adjust the rear view mirror. And I looked at her and I said, honey, really, I'm surprised. I thought we had this conversation. I asked you if you wanted to go try out some other co-ed schools, you know, that I had an anti-bias. And so she says, mommy, you were talking like you were at work again. I didn't know what you were talking about. I was seven years old. I didn't know what a single <laughs> sex school was. I said, oh. I said, so you just went to NCS because all my friends were going there. And I said, oh. Well, it turned out she never left. And she graduated, played volleyball at, at Bucknell, and has had a terrific time. But you know, we, we hear that this is all about finding a way to have young women get a path to science and technology like after sixth grade, where they feel as if they're not going to be intimidated, where they're going to be really given a sense that they have a real future. And while I buy into all of that, and I think it's important that we find mentors for, for young women and that we really move things forward, I don't think anything beats it but success. And I think the way to make women feel important in these industries and feel important in these sciences is to have them start to be in charge of them and start to get to the head of the class like people like Donna and like we do here. And I know we've had two new promotions in the last few days, which I think are terrific. But I also think that it's important that part of it is that we have all of us in this room, men and women, put that value and make that value something that we're willing to talk about. Talk about among, each, among ourselves, but really talk about to the outside world. And until we decide that we're going to change things ourselves, no one's going to change it for us. Mr. Bates wasn't going to change the way Wall Street dealt with the fact that they didn't have enough people with the names of the firms being born to, to satisfy the number of people they needed for the 20th century and the 21st century, where everyone was going to become a member of an investor class. So they needed people. And they weren't birthing them themselves, so they had to go find them. And they were going to come from places like Harrison, New Jersey, not Harrison, New York. And once he bit down hard on that one and decided, well, I'm going to kind of create one myself, and I was his little lab rat. Once that started to work, opened the floodgates. And thousands and thousands and thousands of people started to, went to Wall Street in the 70s and 80s. Now, unfortunately, there's been a, a contraction of that industry for lots of reasons. But there still are plenty of people whose family never worked on Wall Street who now have a family business of people working on Wall Street. We're only going to change things for women in the STEM area and in computing ourselves. And that means that we have to be excellent, as I know we are, but we also have to be aggressive and work and push and nicely cajole, never demand, but make it a priority. Women get into the room when other women help men open the door. That's just the way it is. And we here have the most to gain and the most at risk. We have the most to gain because of the talented people we have now. We have the most to risk because we still have a problem recruiting and retaining. We still don't have a growth industry of young women becoming scientists and going to graduate school and becoming qualified to come here. We just don't. No one's going to do it for us. Only we can do this. It means the most to us. So we have the most work to do. You know, people ask me, what do you do now? I do only what I want to do. Isn't that nice? But what I want to do looks vaguely familiar. It looks just like, it, like what I was doing when I was working. Uh, I'm on the boards here. I 
don't do any, I don't lead any talks anymore with the Russians, but now I lead track two talks with the Russians. So I talk to them about missile defense, and I talk to them about disarmament, and I talk to them about non-proliferation, and, you know, kind of looks vaguely familiar. I do a lot of cancer work now because I did survive a tough cancer, and I work for a group, work with a group called the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, which is the 21 large cancer hospitals. And next month, I'll be the chairman of the board of their foundation. And I get to do things that I like to do that are also things I've pretty much always done because it's my life's work. And it is what has grounded me and what has given me so much satisfaction. And one of the reasons why I was so interested in an honor to be asked to be on the board of both Livermore and Los Alamos is because I believe that I still have work to do with these organizations. You know, change is coming. Sequestration is today, I guess. Everything is crazy, crazy back in Washington. It's going to be very difficult to see, but I will predict that it will look like an avalanche only when you realize that it is an avalanche. All avalanches start with just a few grains of snow and a little bit of a sense of movement. And by the time you realize that you're in trouble, it's a little late, hard to get out of the way. And I'm afraid that that's what this sequestration might be like. And I'm hoping that my former colleagues in both the House and the Senate and the administration will understand that we've got to get things in a much more predictable sense. We've got to get 13 budget put down and understood. We've got to get 14 up and going. We've got to deal with getting the CR, an omnibus agreement, along with getting, hopefully, an avoidance of another fiscal cliff. Will they get it right? They haven't so far. So I'm not as optimistic as I might be if I was still there. I'd also be tearing my hair out if I was still there, and I wouldn't be the nicest person to be talking to either. But I think, you know, we have unfortunately too many hyperpartisans in the Congress. You know, too many people that don't have competitive seats because of redistricting that has been rigged by the political parties. And so most Americans don't understand that your seat is either a Democratic seat or a Republican seat, and somebody's made that decision in the one year after the zero year of a census. And so you're going to have a Democrat or a Republican, pretty much. Hope you like it. Person's fungible. Could be any person, but they're going to have a primary. And most of the time, they're not going to have a general election, so they're not going to be forced to come to the center. And so that's going to keep them as a hyperpartisan. And that's been going on, unfortunately, for too long in the Congress, and that's why, unfortunately, we have too many people in the Congress that are not willing to be moderated and are not willing to work in a bipartisan way. And that's an unfortunate set of circumstances, but you know, we've got it a little bit better in California. We changed our law, and now we have a law that says that any two people that run in a primary, the two top vote getters, regardless of party, advance to the general election. So you can have two Democrats, two Republicans, a Democrat and a third party person, a Republican and a third party person, an independent. So in California, we've got things a little bit better because we changed our law to make sure that we had nonpartisan redistricting done by a commission of average citizens, drawing the lines, not along party lines, but to keep communities of interest, and that you could have people run against each other, like we had in my former congressional district with Pete Stark and my former intern, Eric Swalwell. And so we've got it right here in California. So does that mean that we don't have to worry about what's going on in the rest of the country? No, because we don't have 218 votes in California. We only have 53. And until the rest of the country gets it right, we're still going to have to deal with hyperpartisans in the other parts of the country who are going to obstruct what's going on in the Congress. So let me bring it back and give you some of my little pieces of my own personal advice. 
in order for us to get what we want ultimately, which is the very best people, men and women, working here and working throughout Northern California, but especially in, in the science and STEM area, so that we get the best science that we can possibly get. And we have hardworking people that are going to get rewarded with great jobs that have predictability and funding. <coughs> Sounds like utopia, but it, it is something that we can achieve. The way we do that is to continue doing what we're doing. But it's also to make sure that we're demanding of each other and of our institutions for equity for, and for fairness, which I know we have here. But that we also have to bootstrap each other. Bootstrap each other because culturally we are intertwined and linked. And there is no one person's success here that is above anybody else in the collective. That's how we do things. We do things in a collective way. So it's important for all of us to continue to work hard to make sure that we amplify our voices inside and outside of this environment to make sure that we make very clear what our vision for the future is. And that is to have much more of a balanced, much more of an equal opportunity, much more of a balanced census for the people that are working here in the future, knowing that we have done everything we can to do the best we can now. The things that I care about are, I think, the things that you care about. A long time ago, I learned that the only person that I could ever have as a judge of my integrity and my honesty and my worth was myself. I decided to put a premium on those things for myself so that I never had to question what I was doing, my motives, or how I did things because I could represent to myself that I had done the best I could. Far from perfect, and I don't always get what I want, and I don't always achieve what I want, but I sleep well at night because I know that I've tried as hard as I possibly can. When I talk to my Catherine about the future, what she should use to measure her success. I always remind her that it's never about money. It's never about status. It's never about popularity. And it's never about your ability to have something that someone else has. It's only about satisfying your own sense of worth. If you believe that you are worth only what is good and what is honestly gained that helps others and the collective, you will always, always come out well in the end. If you remember that if you can pay it forward, and deliver for others what they cannot achieve for themselves just because you should, and hopefully without them knowing, you will get everything you deserve. Being true to yourself is the only reward of an honest person. An honest person only needs to satisfy themselves. Do you owe things to other people? Of course. Do you owe honesty, integrity, hard work to other people? Of course. But only you, only you can decide if you have done all that you can. 
Those are easy lessons to incorporate in a life of service and a life of science. And that is what I believe we have here at these labs. Hard-working Americans, the ultimate patriots. You don't have those yellow ribbons in the backs of the cars. People aren't saying, those physicists, I can't live without them. <laughs> they should be, but they aren't. But you've known that from the beginning. And you've known that because of the type of work that you do. In many cases, people can't know what you do. But I know. So let me take this one minute to say thank you very, very much for everything that you do. Thank you for your hard work and your patriotism and your dynamism and your community and your love of country and of your friends and neighbors. And thank you for the sacrifice. I know that you can be financially rewarded much more significantly in parts of the, what they call the real world. Please don't do that. Please stay here because what you do here will make the difference in everyone's life and in everyone's sense of security. I think that there's probably one or two easy questions in this room. If I can answer them, I'm happy to do that. Otherwise, I just wanted to thank you for the time that I've had with you today to get to share some of my feelings for you. Um, you know, in, in public life, it isn't very easy to talk about your feelings. But I find it easy to talk about my feelings when I come here because I think over the last arc of 17 years that we've been together, we've gotten to know each other pretty well. I know that when I was fighting cancer, uh, so many of you were thinking of me, and I know that your prayers were answered when uh, the cancer went away. Uh, I thank you very much for that. So if you have any questions uh, that, that are easy, I'm happy to try to answer one or two. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll let you go back to your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Who has an easy question? Yes, ma'am. She's hysterical. <laughs> you know, I have to be careful because I see that guy with the camera back there. But I will tell you that uh, I've known Hillary since 1992. Um, she's a fantastic wife and mother, a fabulous friend, a loving friend. And she's got a bawdy sense of humor. And, you know, like we all do. And she's very, very very, very high energy and dynamic. But um, you know, when I found out that I had this state, you know, st bad stage three esophageal cancer, I called her. And I called her chief of staff, Cheryl Mills, who's a friend of mine. And I said to her, I've just been told this. And I have to start, you know, today's Thursday at 5 o'clock. I have to start chemo on Monday. And I'm going to have eight rounds of chemo and 25 rounds of radiation. And I'm going to have this radical surgery. But as undersecretary, I had, well, I'd like to say special powers, but I had you know, signing authority for a number of different things, Iran sanctions, a bunch of things. You know, I did all of the arms sales, obviously all the negotiations, 600 people, three bureaus. Um, and I wanted to see what Secretary Clinton wanted to do. You know, should, did she want me to take a leave, or what did she want me to do? At some point, I was going to get sequestered bad word. I was going to get isolated. <laughs> I was going to get isolated um, and then try to get healthy to have this surgery. So I, call, so I called Cheryl. I told her. She was upset. And she said, I'll call you right back. She called me right back. And she said, um, Hillary's coming back from the White House. She'll come to your house or do you want to come to the office? And I said, I'd come back to the office. So I went to the office. 
you know, and when I told her, she burst into tears. And, you know, I hadn't had a lot of practice telling anybody, and I thought, oh, God, is this what it's going to be like? <laughs> and, and right away, you know, what? Or, you know, what are we going to do? You know, let's go to New York. Let's go, you know, I'll call someone. And I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I said, I've got pretty much my team put together. My variable is my surgeon, and I ended up using a guy at Duke. Um, but I've got, I know what I'm doing. This is pretty straightforward. And so she said, how do you want to do this? I said, well, what do you think? And she said, um, I don't want you to go. I want to see you. I want to know you're OK. And I said, well, you can do that. I said, but I will stay in my job because it will be better optically if I do. And so I haven't told many people this. So part of the downside of my chemo, because it's poison. So here I am, Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security, ridding the world of weapons of mass destruction and using chemical weapons <laughs> and radiological <laughs> weapons to kill my cancer. <laughs> I'm for that. I named my tumor, I hope I don't offend anybody, eat shit and die. <laughs> and it did. But you know, 25 rounds of chemo and uh, 25 uh, rounds of chemo, radiation and eight rounds of, at the same time. So we're, we're not good. So one of the side effects of my um, chemo was my hand, my writing hand, uh, was basically numb. Very much like, you know, like you could go bang, 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 couldn't feel anything. I could move it, but I couldn't really grip a pen. And so literally my, my chief of staff would call me and he'd say, I've got a whole bunch of things. I'm coming to your house for you to sign. And so I would spend about a half an hour with my hand in a bucket of hot water, try, just trying to get it to go. And then I would you know, try to get, get my hand around the pen. And then I would ha have to hold my hand like this. And I'd, I'd have to do my signing. And you know, I'd say to him, he'd say, I'd say, how many do you have? And he'd say, like 12. I'd be like, 12. OK. You know, and I would sign my name. They actually had to come down with a guy with a gun to Duke when I was recovering from the surgery for 23 days in the hospital for me to sign. And you know, I said, don't tell anybody. You know, so at the time, he said, um, somebody said something like, well, you know, do, you want to talk, you know, do, do you want us to tell anybody about this? And I said, no, because you know, if people find out that I really can't, I'm having a hard time signing my name, you know, the cons conspiracy theorists in Washington work full time on nothing. I said, pretty soon it won't be that I signed my name on these things. It don't, it'll be some you know, auto pen or something. So I you know, had to practice doing it. But she's just amazing. You know, I was for her in 2007 for president. That's why I was surprised I was invited into the Obama administration. But um, and I'm for her. If she ever wants to run, I'm for her. You're welcome. Yes? I still have an anti-bias against single-sex education. <laughs> it's just me. I, I mean, I, I, I get it. I really do. I understand it. And the statistics are persuasive. They really are very persuasive, especially when it comes to stuff like you know, math and science and computation analysis and statistics and, and you know, physics and all that stuff. The numbers are not kidding. Young women in single-sex schools don't have the same kind of sociocultural uh, pressure uh, to perform and to deal with the boys that are just more physically and more verbally aggressive. You know, teacher, teacher. And the numbers are real. I just, and I have lots of friends uh, that went to, you know, great women's schools and have done very, very well and, you know, love them and have fabulous relationships and have, you know, Normal relationships, you know, it's not like you can't have real relationships because you go to a single sex school, but I find that for me, that there, it's an artificial environment. Now, maybe it's like training wheels. Maybe, it's a, maybe that what these single sex schools offer young women, in, especially when it comes to math and science, is enough w wind under their sails that 
they are never that they never get in, in intimidated in the future. That they they really find their voice. Maybe that's true. I hope that's true. Um, I just knew for Catherine, I wasn't worried about her getting mowed over by some kid. That wasn't going to happen. Um, but not, but she apparently didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> I didn't know what you were talking about, mommy. Yes, ma'am. Just trying to pay the bills. Just trying to, you know, I did not. I, and I really found it to be a little, uh, when I went on the New York Stock Exchange, there was this whole spread on, on the front page of the New York Times, a big deal. It was a very big deal. Uh, I went on the Today Show. Um, they, you know, I didn't like being treated differently, but actually felt, in retrospect, that I was, um, if I could, if I could, pay it forward if I could actually leave the door open behind me and let some other women in. Sure enough, Merrill Lynch sent a woman six weeks later. Um, soon after, there were a couple of other women. By the time I was there three and a half years, there were only five or six women. There's never been, a, a, you know, 50 percent women uh, having seats on the New York Stock Exchange. Part of it was the money was prohibitive. Uh, part of it was the lifestyle is prohibitive. It's very physically grueling. Um, the time that I was on the New York Stock Exchange, we went from about a 974-point Dow and about 25 million shares a day to over 100 million shares a day. People can't move that fast. It was computers. And, but, but this one day, the prob biggest problem I had was the men had these liveried uh, men's rooms, marble, liver, you know, men holding cloth towels. There were six of them on the trading floor, and there were no women's rooms. And I went to the women's room where the clerks went. Now, it was actually fabulous because in the end, you have to, you know, the girls have to have this eyeball look at each other. Now, I was different. I was a member. And I wanted them to feel like I was you know, leave the door open for them. And so I went to the clerk's bathroom, which was, had no liveried cloth towels. And I did get my revenge because on the day that we went through 75 million shares, uh, I came running off the floor to go to the sixth floor to the bathroom. And the CBS Evening News people were waiting for me because it was always interview the girl. So I was always getting interviewed. And so I, guy sticks the camera, you know, in my face and the microphone, and I said, I've got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and he, and he kind of looks at me, and I, and I said, oh, you think there's a bathroom over there? No, there for the boys. I said, I have to go to the sixth floor. I'll be right back. <laughs> the next day, so they divided one of the men's rooms. And, you know, so here I am, you know, so I felt a little, I felt my toe tapping, but, you know, they're all proud, you know, they're about 8.30, market opens at 10. I'm upstairs at the partners meeting. They call me, oh, can you come downstairs? I come downstairs. And they got the guys, you know. And I was like, so wait a minute. You're dividing this six-stall bathroom so that I get a stall? This is not like a flush of optimism on your part. <laughs> is it just me? I mean, is this, or is this going to be like every restaurant in the world where there are, you know, the men walk in and there, there's never a line and the women are always waiting on line? I said, you know, we, we just have a couple of things we've got to do in there. It takes us a little longer. It's a little inconvenient. We just, you know, I said, make it bigger. Give me two stalls. <laughs> you know, maybe there's somebody coming behind me. And they were like, oh. <laughs> so we did have our first two-stall women's bathroom. It was quite a big deal, quite a big deal. It was really fabulous. <coughs> Anybody else? Yes, sir. Ma'am. Yes, no, no, we don't. 
Um, yes, it is all about the people that are crazy. Um, you know, we have unfortunately hyperpartisanship that is a result of non -part of partisan redistricting um, has caused people that don't have a temperament for compromise to go to Washington. <clears throat> and that is a pox on all of our houses. And as I said, you know, we've got a pretty good deal here in California. We, we have the ability to now have, uh, we have had nonpartisan redistricting that, that the voters voted for. We have had redistricting in a way that has, has moved things around. And um, now the two top vote getters, regardless of party, advance to the general so that we don't have a, a sense of hyperpartisanship here. Um, we can be self-satisfied and smug, except that we don't have 218 votes and we have 49 other states that will, you know, that will not get us what we need when it comes to the kind of, you know, bipartisan attitude. I don't know what possesses people to think that they can actually go home. There's 37, maybe, maybe it's even 57 people that voted against the bill yesterday. I don't know how they actually think that they can sleep at night without an bo armed bodyguard next to them and why their wife isn't going to roll over and kill them. <laughs> I mean, really, what can, what can you possibly, but it's the same kind of people that voted against the disabled uh, treaty about five weeks ago. Bob Dole, you know, mortally injured, barely survives World War II, and, you know, has an arm that doesn't work, becomes a United States senator, becomes majority leader. He's ill. And he comes out of Walter Reed and goes to the Senate to, to prevail upon his new colleagues to please vote for the international equivalent of the Disabilities Act to protect disabled people. And unfortunately, too many people in the Senate come from the House and don't have any temperament for compromise, and they vote it down. Bob Dole, they vote it down. It's an absolute embarrassment. And it's the same kind of people. They don't come to Washington for the reasons that you're meant to. You know, they carry little pocket constitutions around with them, but they've never read them. And they don't have a spirit of service. You know, I was a Democrat. I am a Democrat, but I didn't go to Congress as a Democrat. My party, you know, made sure that I had an office and that I had committee assignments, but I didn't owe, Na owe Nancy Pelosi a vote. But, you know, if, if hyperpartisanship is how you get to go to work every day and you, how you keep your seat, then if you've got to keep the fringes away, then you've got to join the fringe. And that's unfortunately what we have. So the way around this is to have a national redistricting, national nonpartisan redistricting. And California has got to start to insist that the rest of the country do what we did. You don't have to do it the way we did it. They just have to represent that it's as fair as the way we did it. I'm not for telling people how to do things. I'm just for the outcome. I want the same outcome. You choose how you do it, and if you can represent to me that the way you do it is as fair as the way we do it, I don't care how you do it. But I want a fighting chance with my 53 votes to get to 218 because you've sent people that take their medication on time and that are actually there to do their job not to do something that keeps their job. So I think California, you know, as usual, we've got to do what we can to kind of get the rest of the country sh ship shape. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.